Thanks so much, Artie, and thanks, Artie and Jack, for inviting me. Um, and that anecdote isn't entirely true. You know that. Um, but nonetheless, um, I appreciate that Artie and Jack gave the two lupus talks, or the exciting ones, going fo looking forward to the previous two speakers, and asked me to review stuff um, that is, as, I, as Artie said, 75 years old. The title, The Almighty ANA, is from Jack and Artie, and I'll get into that. Uh, in a moment. We have learning objectives here uh, to describe the assay of these tests and the problems, to describe it as a criterion for classification of lupus and the problems, and to describe the expression of ANAs in otherwise healthy populations, a real problem that we uh, struggle with. Uh, sadly, I have no disclosures. Um, so why do Artie and Jack think the ANA is almighty? And as Artie mentioned, um, it was really 74 years ago that Malcolm Hargraves reported the LE cell phenomenon in bone marrow samples from patients with lupus. And this was the beginning of research that led to the development of anti-nuclear antibodies. And these are important basically because it, they were the first evidence that autoimmunity could cause human uh, disease. And in fact, studying of the ANA really is a pillar of modern rheumatology. Eventually resulted in a relatively clear delineation of lupus from all of the other kind of inflammatory diseases that could cause similar manifestations. Over the past 75 years, there have been more than 50,000 papers published on this topic, and I'm sure you've read most of them. I'll just review a couple. Um, over the years, there have been multiple species of ANA uh, described, with some with clinical importance, but after 75 years, their role in clinical rheumatology is still uh, being heavily uh, debated. So. Let me get the immunopathogenesis over early, and then we can get into the clinical manifestations. But we've learned a lot about what these antibodies uh, do, and subspecies of ANA, uh, in this case the anti-DNA, and the anti-RMP have told us a lot about the pathology of lupus. The first, the anti-DNA here on your left, is uh, 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 antibody that's produced by uh, proliferating short-lived plasma blasts. We know that because they disappear when you use anti-proliferative agents. The antibodies themselves can bind largely to material from dead and dying and apoptotic cells, and uh, when they do that, they form immune complexes. And those complexes can deposit in the kidney and contribute to lupus uh, nephritis. And they can do a number of other things, activate, complement. And what's new is it's clear that these complexes can also activate the production of cytokines, and especially type 1 interferon, that themselves can contribute to disease. Now, whether or not these form immune complexes are governed by two very important enzymes, DNAase 1 and DNAase 1L3. In the absence of these enzymes, one gets a predilection for more aggressive uh, lupus. And what these enzymes do basically is degrade DNA, the cargo of these immune complexes. However, even when these don't form immune complexes, they have biologic activities, including cross-reacting uh, with um, uh, receptors in the neurologic uh, system and perhaps causing some CNS uh, disease and a variety of other actions. RMP antibodies are different. Because of Gordon Sharp's discovery or report in 1972 about mixed connective tissue disease being associated with high titers of RMP, there's been really very little study of anti-RMP in lupus, but it occurs frequently, not at, as high titers in, uh, as in MCTD, but also can contribute a lot. Anti-RMP antibodies don't vary very much with disease activity, even with therapy, and they're therefore thought to be the products of long-lived plasma cells. These can also form immune complexes, 
with apoptotic material, and when they do, they have activities. But their activities are somewhat different than those of anti-DNA antibodies. Primarily, they induce the production of cytokines, uh, but they can do a number of other things, alter the biology of neutrophils. But there's no convincing evidence that these immune complexes contribute to um, uh, lupus nephritis or to complement activation at all. Again, the activity of these complexes is governed by uh, a variety of RNAases, but even the uh, antibodies without cargo can basically also cause changes in neutrophil function, so they clearly have biologic activity. Now, this is a complicated slide, but it's something that we've learned about the activity of um, uh, immune complexes containing uh, nucleic acids. And in your upper left, you can see that these immune complexes are taken up by FC receptors and deposited within the endosomal compartments. In these compartments are a variety of TLRs that can bind either RNA or DNA. And the RNA binding ones, TLR8 and 7 and 3, um, are there, but TLR9 can bind DNA, the cargo of the immune complexes, when these receptors engage RNA or DNA, they can basically stimulate the production of type 1 interferon, seen at the bottom. And this appears to be one of the major drivers of the production of type 1 interferon in uh, lupus patients. Here's an example of how uh, one can look to see that. This is a paper from our group. Others have demonstrated this as well. But if you look at the, le at the left, and here is from a very large number of patients. This is um, more than 1,600 patients. And I'll say just as an aside, in order to understand the heterogeneity, you have to look at large numbers of patients. Looking at small numbers of patients over the years has been uh, misleading. And I would encourage all of you, meta-analysis or other kinds of ways to look at huge numbers of patients. It's the only way we're going to really figure out this disease. Regardless, if you look at the left group here, people who are negative for autoantibodies, and this is actually data from the lilly uh, tabalumab trial, largely do not have an interferon signature that's shown on the uh, y-axis. If you look at the next, next group of people, these are people who are RNA positive and DNA positive, and almost all of them have an interferon signature. The third group here are individuals who are RNA pos RNP positive, anti-DNA negative. They have also an interferon signature. Almost all of them have an interferon signature. The next column of those are anti-DNA only positive, and the uh, level of interferon is lower, and many of them have no interferon signature at all. So it's relatively clear that uh, the interferon signature is associated with the presence of autoantibodies, and specifically with anti-RNP antibodies. Now, anti-RNP antibodies, anti-SM, are much more common in individuals of African or Asian ancestry, uh, and a lot of the uh, aggressive disease and aggressive interferon signature in those individuals can be understood as resulting from these ancestral differences in the tendency to generate multiple autoantibodies, including anti-RMP. All right, let's move on and get into the use of ANA in clinical uh, practice. And again, oops, I wonder what happened to that picture. Anyway, the LE cell uh, basically from Hargraves in 1948 was the clue to understand this entire thing. Work um, beginning really in the end of the 40s through the 50s led to the understanding of the, um, uh, the nature of this LE phenomenon. And basically you need a source of apoptotic or dying cells to produce the nuclear material. You need antibodies to nuclear material and you need a monocyte to eat it all. And when all of that happens, you basically, or a neutrophil, when all of that happens, basically, you get um, the LE cell phenomenon. Understanding that led to the development of many other ways to detect 
anti-nuclear antibodies, of which the uh, immunofluorescence assay is the one that's the most popular, initially done with animal tissue, a variety of cells, um, and finally, uh, and you know, basically, uh, the uh, immunofluorescence test replaced the LE prep in the late 60s or 70s. HEP2 cells were eventually uh, identified as the standard for immunofluorescence assays in the 80s. These are a human cell line. Its origin is not entirely clear, uh, but um, part of it comes from HeLa cells and part of it comes from cell lines generated from tumor models. And it's important that a lot of the early work, a lot of the things that we studied early on looking at tissue slices are not entirely replicable with HEP2 cells because the antigens they express are not entirely the same. So here is a slide, um, and again, anybody who was a rheumatology fellow more than 25 years ago spent a fair amount of time learning about studying all of these uh, patterns uh, and um, uh, understanding what those uh, patterns uh, meant. But these, these are patterns of immunofluorescence using HEP2G cells, and uh, one would learn that the particular patterns in general correlated with the presence of specific autoantibodies and in general predicted um, uh, something about the likelihood of a patient uh, having that particular uh, pattern. And again, you couldn't be a rheumatology fellow without wandering around and, and finding some unique pattern and uh, harassing some poor resident about his ignorance, not understanding what that pattern uh, meant. I suspect we don't do that much anymore. Well, there's now a professional consortium that does this called ICAP. They've identified 29 different patterns. So for those of you who really want to be a... Um, an expert in this field, you have a lot to learn. And some of these patterns, I must say, I've never seen. So what are the nuclear antigens? And there are tons of them. There's DNA, there's RNA, there are proteins, nucleic acid, protein complexes. All of them are found in the cell nucleus. Many of them actually have important functions, although in these assays, you're just using them basically as targets of antibodies. Um, they can leave the cell during cell death of various sorts and therefore become immunologic, acti uh, immunologic targets and involved in immune activities uh, in the form of immune complexes. We use a lot of uh, terminology. It gets a little bit confusing. ANA implies the antibodies target molecules in the cell nucleus. However, there are a lot of antigens in the cytoplasm as well. Uh, anti-ribosomal P, a variety of others. There are some important, some only expressed in mitotic cells. Um, but nonetheless, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about whether they should be called anticellular or anti-HEP2 antibodies. But in general, uh, rheumatology are conser rheumatologists are conservative, so we call all of these ANAs regardless of their location these days. And what are they? I mean, Lupus, we have anti-DNA, anti-SM, anti-RMP, and a variety of others. But we tend to think of Sjogren's as more having anti-Rho, anti-La, scleroderma, myositis. And again, MCTD with very high titers of RMP, um, as described by Gordon uh, in 1972. So, again, I've shown you some of this, but... Um, in general, um, we like to think about uh, lupus is associated with anti-DNA antibodies, anti-nucleosomal antibodies. These are antibodies which have been studied for years because of their role in uh, lupus nephritis. I mentioned about RNP uh, being particularly um, uh, prevalent in individuals of African and Asian ancestry and not being associated with uh, antibody, with uh, uh, pathogenesis of uh, lupus nephritis. Again, uh, I think we've gone through all of this. Um, let's talk a little bit about what's happened since then. And, um, you know, ANA basically is a multiplex assay. It's a cell that 
that it contains many, many different molecules, and looking at immunofluorescence patterns can be both informative, but also can be a little bit uh, confusing. Information includes positivity, titers, patterns. Serum frequently have more than one pattern at different titers. The content of the nuclear antigens and the amount of nuclear antigens in the in hep 2, G, HEP2 cells is not always known. And importantly, as I'll mention a little bit, the kits that are available have widely different performance characteristics. They've all been validated as separating patients, sometimes just autoimmune patients, from normals, but their behaviors have rarely been compared. Here, for example, is just one example. Here on your, left, on your right, in this case, the dark, basically staining HEP2 cells using antibodies um, uh, to uh, uh, row 60. And on the top is a monoclonal B, and on D is a, um, a reference serum. And it, cells are clearly negative. Whereas on the left, if you transfect um, uh, row 60 into HEP2 G cells, clearly they become extremely positive. So clearly, if in some strains of HEP2 G cells, if you're interested in anti row 60 antibodies, you won't find them. So what's happened over the years is this is a growth market. The market for ANA antibodies is estimated to be somewhere around $2 billion a year. So as a result, lots of tests have been developed. Nowadays, most indirect immunofluorescence is done by computer reading of the slides with sometimes a human uh, verifying what the computer has done, but it also can be done by immunodiffusion, counter immunoelectrophoresis, and a whole variety of tests. And as I said, most of these have not been compared. Their performance has not been compared. And somebody in your clinical laboratory is frequently the one determining which of these assays uh, you're using, and they may vary over time. Here, for example, is, again, an effort to make these tests work better. This is the BioRad Bioplex. I have nothing to do with BioRad. And you can see on the top, if you look at lupus sera, sera, 40% are anti-DNA positive, 40% are chromatin positive. You can look across, they have all kinds of different um, uh, frequencies. If you look at uh, other conditions, you can see that the frequency of these antibodies tends to be uh, different. And you, get the, and you see table two there, um, you see the fact that when you look at patients versus looking at sera, you get different results. You get the idea that from, from the top that, you know, lupus, you look at multiple antibodies, you could probably make the diagnosis of lupus. But when you look at individual patients, actually what you see is that most people have predominantly one antibody, some have two. By the time you get to four of these antibodies, only a quarter percent of, a quarter of lupus patients have them. So the idea that multiple antibodies are very good to make the diagnosis is correct for some small frequency of patients, but not correct for a large number of individuals. Again, another uh, approach to this, looking at whether or not multiple antibodies are good, and you can see again, uh, looking at the top, um, lupus patients, anti-double-stranded DNA positive by this assay, 77%. That's extremely high for what we knew, what we uh, actually see, uh, SM patients. But again, this isn't looking at patients. This is looking at positive assays. So if you have an anti-double-stranded DNA, three-quarters of those people will have lupus. If you have a positive SM, 80% will have them but only 25% of patients who are of loop, with lupus actually have anti-SM positivity. So again, different ways to look at the data, but um, sensitivity and specificity of these is always an issue. So here's a question, I guess, I think. Yeah. So regarding the use of ANA testing, there's no right or wrong here. I just, we're just interested in opinion. I'm familiar with the ANA platform used in my facility. And don't be embarrassed because most of us aren't. I'm, I routinely use anti-DNA ANA testing to diagnose patients with suspected lupus. I follow patients by routinely repeating ANA testing. I do not find ANA testing useful. 
So we have five, six brave souls, nine. I bet all of you have filled out your brackets, so you probably can guess. Twenty-two. There you go. I routinely use a &E testing to diagnose patients with suspected uh, SLE. Uh, I am 50, oops, 60%. I am familiar with the ANA platform used in my facility, a uh, third of people. And that's a problem, as you'll see. I follow patients by routinely repeating ANA testing, 5%. I do not find ANA testing useful. So there are 3% of people who are actually honest in the audience. So ANA for classification and diagnosis. Let's talk a little bit about this. Um, and here is a problem uh, that came out from our colleagues in, in lupus, in uh, Europe, uh, the, Lu the Euro European uh, lupus mafia and they were interested in studying the performance of the anti-nuclear antibodies for classifying systemic lupus, and they did a systemic literature review, meta-regression of uh, diagnostic data, and basically they found um, that the, the HEP2 ANA test was great to classify lupus. Uh, based on the data, consensus was reached to use a positive ANA of greater than one to 80, by HEP2 cell immunofluorescence as an entry criteria, and then to have seven and three immunologic domains with, high, with hierarchical organization of criteria within domains. And then they would, after a lot of pressure, allow the use of history of ANA, does, and uh, they never really said what the assay should be, and they, um, they didn't, really didn't like multiple autoantibodies as well. Based on this, they developed new criteria for the classification of lupus. Now, classification, academic concept that doesn't really necessarily impact your ability to make a diagnosis. And to give you an example, if you do all the mathematics and look at people who meet classification criteria for lupus, there are about 250,000 in the United States. If you go to the Symphony database, a database of 250 million claims, there are more than one million people carrying the diagnosis of lupus. So obviously classification is important for trials, but it has an important impact because insurers more and more are wanting patients to meet classification criteria before you can uh, use uh, expensive medications. So now we have ANA as a requirement for the classification of lupus. So, and then there's a problem because some centers don't even use HEP2 ANA. What do you do? Um, and then they, you know, they develop an adjudication system. And there are a whole lot of other problems. The major problem being is that the ANA doesn't really have the specificity or even the sensitivity, as I'll show you in a bit, to be used in this way, in my opinion. ANA for screening. So patients with rheumatic disease are heterogeneous. I don't have to tell you that. Symptoms are very, very um, complicated. Um, and there's a difficulty in screening for lupus because of heterogeneity, nonspecific symptoms, a lot of seropositivity in all normals, a lack of standardized assay, as I mentioned. Serology can predate, and serology actually changes to negative. There's an overlap with Putin syndromes, and the demographics I mentioned with regard to differences in African, Asian, and European ancestry individuals. Can you use uh, the lupus, uh, an ANA, to screen patients? And the answer is, only with great risk. Here is uh, some Venn diagrams, um, and uh, what you can see is if you screen normal people with an ANA, most of them will not have lupus. Uh, if you take the positive people, positive ANA people, some of them will have lupus, some will have 
uh, other rheumatic conditions or non-rheumatic autoimmune conditions, and most will have nothing. So as a screening test, it's really not very good. What about the positivity in normals? Well, here's a study by Fred Miller. On the x-axis is age, on the y-axis is positivity. Males and females, you can see. And again, minimum positivity is about 10% in younger people, but it goes up as high as 30%. And after about the age of 30, women become much more positive. But men are also positive. When I went to, when I was in training, we thought about positive ANAs and normals only in older people, but with the more sensitive tests we're using, we can see it much more frequently uh, and see it in both males and females. Uh, increasing prevalence in the United States, and again, paper by uh, Fred with uh, Ed, Ed Chan, and here a lot of data, but what you can see is, is three different time periods. The most recent one you're seeing uh, general um, uh, positivity of lupus around 15%. Uh, it does go up with age, but even young people have a 12% uh, incidence. It's uh, seen more in females than, than males. Um, for a change, body mass index has no adverse effect on anti-DNA uh, or ANA testing, and basically uh, smoking and uh, uh, drinking really don't have a problem. So this is the kind of test uh, we all like because all the things we do to ourselves don't happen to have an adverse effect on this test. But the point is, this is a very common problem now. And that is that out there, there are somewhere around 45 million normal people in the United States with a positive ANA. This really can't be a screening test. So ANA is an otherwise healthy people. And again, one clue of how to evolve this is understanding of this uh, uh, dense fine speckled antibody, which by a ACAP is called AC2. It's a, 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 a protein that's expressed mostly during mitosis, this sort of lens epithelial derived protein. It's um, prevalence is anywhere between two and 16%, originally described by Eng Tan. The importance is that this uh, presence of this antibody does not occur in patients with autoimmunity. Um, in general, this occurs some in patients with cancer, some in patients with HIV, but some people have advocated using this as a way to screen against autoimmunity, and you might begin to consider this, especially if the assay you use reports the ICAP classifications. And here's an example of it. Here you can see that a lot of the mitotic cells here are lighting up with this antibody. The one thing we do have to keep in mind is because of the work from OMRF, Judy James and John Harley, is that in those normal people are individuals who are brewing up lupus. But realistically, we can't really, don't really know how to find them. But this is just to remind you of the work published in the New England Journal of Medicine showing the prevalence of autoantibodies prior to either first symptoms on the bottom or diagnosis on the top uh, of various autoantibodies in people who subsequently got lupus. And it's something we need to always keep in the back of our mind even though the overwhelming number of people without obvious and classic signs and symptoms of lupus who have a positive ANA will not have disease. Staging severity, the last point I want to make quickly is this event, which occurred as a result of our colleagues in uh, the pharmaceutical industry, and this occurred during the development of belimumab, and I must say, probably should be highlighted on the slide of the di diagnosis. Those of us who can remember the phase two trials of belimumab and lupus failed. And they failed uh, for a number of reasons, um, one of which was recognized by Bill Frymouth and Mark Chevrier and others, and that was this trial allowed people to come into the study who were autoantibody negative. Almost a third of the people in this phase two trial were autoantibody negative. So Frymouth and uh, Mark 
created a new entity, which is basically antibody positive lupus. And when they used those as entry criteria for the phase three trials, the trials actually were uh, successful. And that was a critical thing in the development of this trial. And remarkably enough, with no uh, evaluation, the FDA accepted that. So basically, there's a new nosologic entity, active autoantibody positive lupus, which we now all have to uh, deal with. Now, is this reasonable? What this assumes is that all these autoantibodies are relatively stable. Now, we know anti-DNA goes up and down, uh, but we always thought the ANA was stable. But a little study that was carried out by David Pazetsky with Brad Rovin, looking at people with established lupus, well-documented lupus, who had been anti-nuclear antibody positive, a fair percentage of them on the top, anywhere between uh, 5 and 20% of them, were negative. And if depending upon the test you used, a variety of number of these people were negative. So this suggests the possibility that what we thought, ANA was a stable antibody, uh, may not be true. And in fact, others have shown this as well. Here again, looking, this gets worse now and gets into the part about the performance of the different um, ANA tests that are out there. I've listed five of them up there. I have no uh, financial involvement with any of them. But testing the same sera with these five different tests basically gives results that are either 99% positive or 72% positive. Now, most of us don't actually know which test is being used, even by the laboratory that we work with, but this is what we have to consider is this remarkable heterogeneity if we're going to think about this new nosologic entity, ANA positive lupus. Here's a study that was carried out by Mark Chevrier that gets even worse. This was carried out by his colleagues at Janssen, where they took the same sera from one of their clinical trials, and they sent the sera to three separate vendors. This was blind in the sense they didn't tell the vendors they were doing this. One vendor got it all right. Second vendor got about two-thirds of it right, and the third vendor also about two-thirds. And we get to reading the patterns, it got really almost random. So this entity of serologic positive lupus is really problematic because the way we measure uh, ANAs is not standard. There's no real... Uh, validation between tests, and also it appears as though patients with long-standing lupus may become ANA negative. And it's just one last thing. So failure, misunderstandings of classic ANA, failure to recognize the frequency of ANA positive in the general population, failure to recognize the inherent variability of the assay, and confusion resulting from utilization of different platforms with, with results reported as positive or negative. If positive, different patterns may be reported and may be reported incorrectly. So ANA is expression very common in lupus, though the actual frequency not fully known. Uh, immunofluorescence can be both false positive and false negative. Assay differences can lead to variability in ANA detection, thereby limiting its usefulness. Assay issues have implications for clinical care and increasingly important in the identification of patients for clinical trials, research studies, and medication selection. It also, you know, from a, from a point of view of a researcher, tells you something about uh, the biology of lupus, but essentially there's a crying need for validated quantitative assays in order to move forward in, in, these, in this field. So here's a, my last question, a poll regarding the use of it. It disappeared. All right. We will not have the last poll question for technical reasons. I'd like to thank my colleague, David Pazetsky, who really uh, has been a, a mainstay in this research uh, for uh, the last 40 years or so. So here is the poll question came back. 
All, NA, all ANA platforms are interchangeable. All antibodies relevant to lupus are detected. A positive ANA routinely confirms the diagnosis of lupus. ANA are uncommon in normal subjects. ANA is stable in SLE and do not need to be repeated. ANA testing is generally useless, and primary care providers should not be permitted to order ANA testing. So I'm not going to guess. One of these is obviously correct, um, but we'd like to see the results. Let's just agree. You can agree with all of them if you would like. Okay. All right, there we go. We are rheumatologists. Thank you very much for your attention.